Good morning. Well, praise God. I'm glad that you guys are here today. We are back in the book of Luke. In chapter 12, we're going to finish up. And today's highlight verse, Jesus says this in verse 40, Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. How many of you expect him to come soon? I expect him to come soon, too. Because how much worse can it get? That's all right. So let's, let's dive into chapter 12. And first, let's pray. Father, in the midst of all of our flesh and all of our preparation and getting ready in the Christmas season, we want to take time to remember the reason for the season, which is the greatest gift that anyone ever gave or ever received is your son. And I pray that we might receive him well into our hearts and minds this morning, that you might equip us and help us to be able to, as we go forward, just to be lit up for you. I pray that you would do that, Lord, as your word comes out, that uh, I try not to mess it up, and that you would apply it to all of our hearts so that we might become more like you, truly. In Jesus' name, amen. So, just a reminder where you are. A couple of weeks ago, we saw Jesus confront the hypocrites, those who were pretending to be something that they were not. And they were always good, uh, the religious elite, who were always enforcing upon other people all of the <laughs> laws, and yet they themselves were exempt from them. And so we looked at his confronting of hypocrisy. We looked at some accountability in the middle of chapter, uh, the middle of chapter 12, and judgment, how there will be a judgment as we're all going to have to stand before God and give an answer to him as to what we've done in the body. And yet his intimate knowledge of us is that, you know, there are five birds that are sold for two, two pennies and, you know, not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. And then last week we talked about coveting and worrying and Jesus was teaching us not to covet things not to have a desire, and coveting the definition of that is to have a burning desire to have more of what you already have enough of. And that's what coveting is. It's not, oh, gee, have a nice watch. <laughs> no, I, I can observe your watch over there, and I can be glad for you. I don't have to have it. It's just going to weigh down my arm anyway. It's like the, the playing the guitar and stuff. And so coveting is not necessarily appreciating something that someone else has, but it's desiring to have it for yourself and you're not satisfied until you have it. And then when you get it, somehow it turns to ash in your mouth and you need another one or a new one. And that's what coveting is. And we just have this in our sinful nature. And so we talked about that. The guy who was going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns and he was going to sit back, take it easy, eat, drink and be merry, you know, because I can take it easy now and do, it's the American dream. It's called retirement. You know, where you just you amass enough wealth that you don't have to do anything. And then once you unplug and you don't do anything, then you have no purpose. It ends up happening to a lot of people. If you look at the death rates of people after they retire, if they don't find some sense of purpose in their life, they just languish and they deteriorate. So, and that's because we're made to work. Men, did you notice that? We're made to work. We need something. This week... We're going to talk about watchfulness. Jesus exhorts all of us to be watchful. And so I put the meerkats up here because I don't know a more watchful group. <laughs> and they, they always seem to be, you know, they're, they're up on two and they're always looking around and every little sound and then they make little chirping noises to let people know what, you know, let the other meerkats know what's happening. But they're always watchful and this is what they look like. Their whole family of them just sitting there looking. Um, <laughs> Jesus said, you should also be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And so we should be watchful and live our lives with our eyes wide open. Um, being watchful is to be observant, vigilant, sharp, heedful, careful, alert, wide awake, deliberate, intentional, purposeful, resolved, zealous, tuned in, attentive, and alive. That's what it is to be watchful. And Jesus tells us that's how we're to live our lives. And it seems like all we do is 
we do that and we work real hard so that we can unplug and not be watchful anymore. It's like that's the goal, is to, to get to the place where I find the easy boy in the remote control and you know, back I go, that, that's, that's my goal in life. And yet Jesus says we should always be watchful. Picking it up here from verse 35, Jesus said, let your waist be girded and your lamps be burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks that they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat, and I will come and serve them. So Jesus tells us to be girded. Now, that's a, not a word we use unless it's a girdle, and that's an old school thing to kind of keep your fat from traveling. <laughs> what, what do you, that's, that's, I don't know, that's what I think a girdle is. I, I know I'd, I probably need one, but he says, your waist should be girded. In other words, you should be fully dressed. You should be ready for action. Uh, the folks at this time they used to wear this kind of long garment that would go down about the ankles. And uh, it was no kind of a garment for working in the field. It was no kind of garment to be fighting in a war. And so what they would do is they would kind of reach down and grab the backside and pull it up and tuck it into their belt. And they'd tuck it all up and in so you'd have basically a pair of shorts and then then you're ready for action so when Jesus says that you should be girded and have your lamps burning he's talking about you should be ready for action you should be watchful uh, has nothing to do with undergarments you should be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding if you know anything about the wedding feast uh, that it was a big long one week festival how many of you like to get invited to a one-week wedding? <laughs> it's pretty cool, right? I mean, you take time off, all the relatives go, and you basically camp out, and you invade somebody's house, and there you go. And, and you have a wedding for a week. The master eventually goes away, and he consummates with his bride, but he may come back for his possessions, and it says that you should wait until he comes back. Now, I know that Jesus is coming back. In fact, that will be the first thing that will make everything kind of go straight downhill um, during what, we, what is called in the scriptures the great tribulation. And so we all await for the Lord to come and take us home. Um, I, I think there is nothing standing between us and going home at any moment. I mean, not just me of a heart attack, but any of us, the Lord could come back at any moment. And so we should be ready for that. I don't, I, I always have this, this nightmare when I read through the scripture that I'm going to be in the middle of doing something diabolical when the Lord comes back. And it's going to be like, oh no, he caught me in the middle of this. You know, it doesn't mean I'm not going to heaven. It just means that I'm going to be wasting my time or I'm going to be doing something stupid or wasteful or, you know, playing a game on my phone or something, you know, or so what's, what's the Omicron doing now? I don't know. It's, we get observed with so many things that just aren't important and, and they overtake us and our time. And uh, well, it does me anyway, I'm confessing. So he says that you should be ready to open immediately to him. Blessed are those servants whose, whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and sit down to, and, and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. And Jesus is speaking about how Imagine that, that the God of heaven, Jesus the Son, will be ready to serve us. I feel a little like Peter when Jesus washed his feet and he said, oh, you're not going to wash my feet. I know who you are. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. It, you know, it's not your place to wash my feet. And Jesus insisted, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. He says, all right, let's, let's get this, do it all. Head to toe. I, I, I'm, I'm dirty everywhere. So, you know, Peter, take it easy. You know, <laughs> just your feet, buddy. And he says, do you know what I've done for you? I mean, he took off his outer garment and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And then he filled a basin with water and came over and washed their feet one by one. Can you imagine the silence that just would go over the place? If, if I told you that I have a warm basin of water coming, and I was going to start to wash your feet, and I started with my sister here in the front. I can imagine the silence 
that would fall over the room, like, he's really doing this, I can't believe it. I don't think it was any different when Jesus did. And he washed their feet. And Jesus says, those who are waiting, I will gird myself and be ready to receive you, which I think is, uh, what a tremendous privilege that is. That's the heart of our God, isn't it? And if he, meaning the Son of Man coming back, should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, in other words, prepared and ready, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, that would he have watched and not allowed the house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So he says, if, if I come in the first watch or the second watch or the third watch, by the way, the, the Jews had nighttime hours split up into four hour quadrants or, or uh, three quadrants of four hours. The Romans had it separated into four hours of three hours each. So uh, he's talking about three total watches. The first watch is from six to 10 and then from 10 to two and then from two to six. Uh, that's the Jewish calendar and the way they kept watch, but the Romans actually split it to have four. Um, so they were only, they, they were less, I guess. But that's what Jesus is talking about. I, I, like, I may not come at the time that you think I'm going to come, but you should be ready at any moment. Now, this may not have been traditional church uh, doctrine. This may not have been an understanding in the past, but neither was grace until Martin Luther brought it to the forefront and recaptured it from the scriptures. Um, it, it, it wasn't an invention of Darby or anybody else to think that there would be a rapture, that the Lord would take us home and we should have this ever-present wait and be vigilant because he could take us home at any moment. If you read anything in the New Testament, you will see Paul was expecting to be taken up at any moment. If you look at it, Peter is looking to be taken up at any moment. And I don't know you how you can live with that and have an eschatology where you're like, ah, it's going to be a long time. Nobody knows the hour of the day anyway, so let me build my bigger barns. That's what ends up happening when you don't live with this immediate uh, understanding that Christ could come back at any moment or our lives could end naturally. So he could come back. This, the scripture I have for is 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 9. And Jesus uh, telling us about his coming back. And this is what's written by Paul. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren... Notice, brethren, are not in darkness so that the day should overtake you as a thief. So Jesus said, you guys know better. The rest of the world, it's going to be like a thief in the night when they don't expect. He's going to be like a thief in the night and he's going to take us away. But not for you guys, not you good people. You're not going to, you're not going to be surprised. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. He's not talking about slumber. He's talking about getting lazy with our spiritual walk. And let us watch and be sober. It means sober-minded, not that you can't touch alcohol. It just means be sober-minded, have your wits about you. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So none of us should be surprised. Jesus said, no one knows the hour or the day. But seasons, we could take a look at and we can understand that. And Jesus even tells us in the, in the passage coming up. And there are lots of people who have predicted the exact day when Jesus came. I, you know, I looked at the Babylonian calendar. I looked at the Egyptian calendar. I figured it all out. I worked out the math. He's coming on November 15th. You know, he's coming at the Feast of Trumpets. He's coming at the 
people have all these great, great theories and they have some reason for saying that. And yet Jesus said, no man knows the hour of the day. So anybody who says, I know when Jesus is coming back and it's sometime in the future, unless they give you the season, then they're not being biblical, are they? And there are a lot of Christians that have been tripped up by people, I mean, uh, Harold Camping, I can think of a hundred people who said this, and there were people who sold all their stuff and just, you know, uh, just dissolved everything because they really, really believed, according to him, the exact day when it was going to happen. And there were some people that actually flew over on a flight and went to an island and waited. Uh, the, the weird thing is most of them had return tickets. So how much faith do you really have? And they shouldn't have. You don't have faith in a man. You have faith in Christ. And Jesus said, you're not going to know the day or the hour, but you can know the season. In verse 41, and Peter said to him, of course, Peter's always the spokesman for all the disciples in the midst of him speaking all of this about his second coming. And then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable to us or to all? And the Lord said, who then is a faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them a portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all he has. Did Jesus answer his question? I am sure you've read this many times. He says, are you, are you talking to me? <laughs> That's what in, in the Jersey vernacular, are you, you talking to me? You, Jesus, is this a word for me or is it for everybody? How do you think Peter accepted it? Do you think Peter accepted it as it was a word to him? Or do you think it was a word to everyone? Everyone's afraid to answer. It's because I'm tricky. I'll give you the answer. Yes. Yes. It's like the Good Samaritan where Jesus gave the parable to the Good Samaritan and the lawyer said, uh, you know, what's, what's the greatest, you know, what's the greatest law? And Jesus said, well, how do you read it? And he says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've said, well, that's good. Go do that. And he goes, ah, but wait, one point. Who's my neighbor? I'm looking for a loophole, a guy who asked that question. And then he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And he asks the question, which one of these was a neighbor to the man who had fallen? And he said, the one who helped him. You see how Jesus changed the question? He didn't answer it directly. I love that about Jesus. He's slick. Peter says, you talking to me? He goes, well, who's the good servant who's going to be ready when I come? And when I come, I'm going to put him in charge of everything. Do you think Peter said, yeah, he's talking to me. I think Peter said, yeah, he's talking to me. But you know what? He's talking to you too. Who's the one who's ready? I, emotionally, I'm ready. I'm, I'm tired of all this silliness going around. The Omicron's coming to get you. They got to shut down every school and restaurants. We're all in trouble. It's about as mild as a common cold. But my goodness, it's the Omicron. <laughs> and then comes the Godzilla and the Mothra and the it's just sick, crazy world. I'm, I'm sorry. Am I venting? Forgive me. <laughs> yes, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. <laughs> In Luke 19, verses 17 to 26, and he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, you have authority over 10 cities. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even that which he has will be taken away. It's about stewardship. It's about accountability. It's about using our time that the Lord has gifted to us, by the way, we're just stewards, you know, we're taking care of somebody else's stuff. Even your life is not your own. You know that, right? Just nod, pretend. All of you at the other end of the camera, just nod. Yes, you know. 
It's not our lives. We have time, but we don't know how much. We have opportunities, but we don't know when they'll dry up. And this Christmas is the greatest opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are already primed in thinking about it. It's a great thing. So, Jesus said it's a matter of accountability so that we should be ready when he comes. You remember the story of Joseph and how his brothers took him and threw him in a hole. And some of them conspired to kill him because they were jealous of him. He was dad's favorite and he had special clothing and he was younger than all of them but one. And they got mad at him and these brothers did what brothers do, but they did it to an extreme. They threw him in a well that was dry and uh, stripped his coat off of him, tore it and put blood all over it and brought it back to their dad. And they say, hey, does this look like uh, your son's coat? Because uh, we found this. Can you imagine the depth of deceit? Well, Joseph then gets sold and he goes off into Potiphar's house and because God's with him and God blesses him, he does exceptionally well. And his brothers, years later, end up standing before him and don't even recognize the young boy that they threw in a pit and sold for money. And he's now the second in control of all of Egypt. And because he was there, they were smart enough to store all of the grain which they knew they would need because the Lord gave a vision to Pharaoh. They'd have seven years of good and seven years of, of want. And he said, well, what you need is a good manager. Store it away so that you have enough because I can't think of anybody more in touch than you. And he instantly promotes him right from prison. Can you imagine? What are your qualifications? Well, I'm in jail right now. If you get me out, it'd be cool. And then I could rule your kingdom for you. Who does that? God does that. But you see, Joseph was ready. And you don't ever hear him whisper a complaint no matter what trouble he was in, he was ready. And I think he was faithful to the very end. And God blessed that. And I think he'll bless us when we do the same. In Genesis it's in three, uh, 39 verse 3, it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that makes all the difference. And that the Lord had made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. And he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. So that it was from that time that he had made him overseer of the house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian house for Joseph's sake. Isn't it interesting that your employer reaps the benefits of you having a relationship with God? They get an awesome employee. They get an awesome, the United States gets an awesome citizen. And this country is blessed because people believe in Christ. And people don't know that. So, bless the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and the field. You see, Joseph was faithful to be obedient to God. And God blessed his faithfulness by pouring out his spirit on him. And he gave him wisdom and honor. I don't know that we can expect less from God when we do that. Verse 45. But... Jesus chose the other side of not being watchful and waiting. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying and is coming. And he begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour when he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. That's one of those happy passages. <laughs> Just like Joseph, we need to be faithful and hold on. And he says, but if that servant goes off and begins to be faithless and begins to beat his male and female servants, Jesus is telling a bit of a parable here, isn't he? Who's he talking about? He's talking about Israel. He's talking about himself getting beaten. He's talking about all the prophets that have come before him, including John the Baptist had his head cut off. 
Who's Jesus talking about? He's talking about those who were unfaithful with his word. They didn't do it. They knew it and they propagated it and they were professors of it, but they weren't observers of it. That's one. The other is, I think you will always show what your nature is. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can no longer continue to sin because the spirit of God lives inside of you. But if somebody wears the name tag, you know, and they have the bumper sticker and, you know, they, they've, they've got a bulletin and they know all the worship songs, what's coming out of them? If you start to see abuse for others, you got to start wondering if this person really has a relationship with Christ. And I think it's a good idea to broach that subject. And Jesus said, if, if you start to do that and you start to lose it, like a lot of people at work, I don't know if you guys think it's okay to play solitaire while you're working or be on your cell phone. It's very quiet in there. <laughs> but it, it's very, like when you first get a new job, it's one of those things where you want to do good. You know, you want to, you want to show the boss what you can do and you do everything excellent. In fact, you'll do everyone else's work and it's good. You know, I'll do your, hey, what are you doing? Playing solitaire? Okay, I'll take that. What are you, playing a video game? <laughs> What are you doing? All right, no problem. I got it. I got this. I can stack it up. I can take care of it. And you start knocking it out, you know. But then after you're there for a while, you start looking around and go, why am I working so hard? You make more money than me. I'm going to play solitaire. <laughs> and it's the tendency that we think that Jesus isn't going to come back right away. And Jesus is cautioning on that. Don't get that mentality. Don't get the mentality of you're just going to kick back and coast. Be vigilant because he's going to come at a, tame, a time that you, you're not aware of. And there are all kinds of stories about people that are not careful about the way that they live. I read a story about a sex abuse case that came up against a very famous preacher in his church because someone thought they saw someone touch a child inappropriately. And they made it a lawsuit and they went to court and this person, you know, was, was ridiculed. And it turns out that it didn't happen the way the, the person viewing it really, it happened. And so this guy was vilified in a church who was a volunteer watching kids. And he was put on a watch list and all this stuff before anything was found out. This guy ended up suing the church for $10 million dollars because they were, you know, making stories about him and propagating this in the news and put his face up on the TV screen. And I think that's, can you imagine? Somebody thinking they saw something and they were mistaken, uh, but they pushed it and they, they got, you know, child services involved and made it a big deal and turned it into a, a big thing. And it was contrived. It was misunderstood. And now the guy's suing the church for $10 million for defamation of character and all this other kind of stuff. We need to be careful in this life. We need to be vigilant and wait for the Lord, but also make sure that we don't let things get out of hand. You know, things can get out of hand. You guys know what I'm talking about? Things can get out of hand. And the flesh can be aroused very easily. We need to be on watch. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. I don't know if you've been involved with... Uh, being abused at work by having an employer who's completely unreasonable or even violent, uh, threatening. It's, it's toned down a whole lot now because people get sued all the time for frivolous things. So when real things happen, uh, you know, you want to keep that to a minimum. And of course, there's special training that you go through. There's, I think there's a special ring of hell for people who are vicious. There's a special punishment. I don't think, I don't think everyone's going to share the same level with Hitler, for instance, um, or Mengele, or, you know, these folks that actually enjoyed 
torturing and, and causing pain and hardship on people. I think there's a special level. Uh, Dante's Inferno has all these different levels, which uh, I'm sure they're not all accurate, but I, I can't imagine that the same people are all going to have equal punishment. And Jesus says, those who step over that line, and although you may wear a title and you may punch your card and come to church and warm a seat and have a bulletin and a bumper sticker, it doesn't mean that you know him. And that's a caution for us. What, what is the activity of our lives? Am I, am I living in sin, in some known sin? And if so, I really have to wonder, am I really his? Because if I'm really his, I won't be doing that. And he says, when you know better, the punishment's going to be worse. And how much, how much more well-informed could the people of this world be where you carry a computer in your pocket and you have, everyone has a computer and everyone has access to information. To reject Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him is an atrocity in this country because it's so, so prevalent. I mean, Christmas shouts it out, tries to drown it out with the Santa substitute, but Jesus is still proclaiming what a great opportunity for us. For people to reject him at this point in time, I think is there, there's a special level for that. And we're told about that. By the way, uh, if you're at work, 55% of distractions in the workplace are caused by cell phones. These, some of the things I look up. 75% of employers say that two or more hours are lost every day due to distractions. And 28% there's an increase in mistakes after an employee gets a phone call. They're actually checking all these things. So if you get a phone call, you say, oh, one second, Boston. Oh, yeah, yeah, how you doing? Okay, what are you doing there? Blah, 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 blah. And then you go back to work, you got a 28% increase in making a mistake. So if we are that easily distracted, how easily can we be distracted from remembering that the Lord could come back at any moment? I think the it's a very high incident. And Jesus then says, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Jesus was talking about looking forward and about his second coming and he hadn't even been crucified yet. And he said, I'm looking forward to to that. There's a, there's a fire that needs to come, a cleansing that needs to happen, and I wish it were already kindled, but there's something else I have to do. I have a baptism or an immersion. He was going to get immersed into death is what it was. He's talking about his crucifixion. It wasn't a baptism. He was already baptized by John in the Jordan. But he says, he, I, I have something I need to go through and do before I do that. But when he comes again, he's going to come as judge. He's not going to come as savior as he did the first time. He's going to come as judge, and we now have enough information. So we'll have to stand before him. Verse 51. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? Well, don't we, don't we sing peace on earth? Goodwill towards men, don't we? Jesus said, really? And he didn't even hear the song. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five and one house will be divided, three against two, two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against her mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, which is a little more common. But see, Jesus said, I haven't come to bring unity. You know, that's what we strive for in this world. Can't we all just get along? You know, can't all the churches just kind of believe all the same thing and wash out all the distinctions so that we all, well, there'll be no distinctions is what it would be. Can't we all just get along? I mean, Jesus came and died for us. No, it brings division. In fact, I think there are some people, I... I know some people who have given their lives to Christ and changed radically. And when they tell their parents and when they tell their family, their family is incredibly disappointed and very upset and think you got in a cult and all this other stuff. They're almost better that you're sleeping around, doing drugs, beating people up. You're a, I can't believe you're, 
Jesus, really? What a crutch, man. Why don't you go back to drugs? Oh, I've, had, I've had people that would be happier if their kid went back the way they were, you know, complete derelict doing uh, the craziest of things. Because to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and devote your life to him just seems so alien to some people. It's just like you're out there, man, like... And Jesus said, I've come to bring division. By the way, Jesus will bring division. And it will test you to see what is really your choice. Did you choose Christ or you didn't? Maybe you just thought you did. If you do, it's going to create division. It's going to create hardship in your own family, even. The people that are closest to you. In fact, Jesus says this, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. In Matthew 10, 36. If you want to look it up in case you think I made it up. And, you know, there are lots of reasons families don't get along, you know, uh, because you think you're an elf, that would do it. Um, and people fight during the holidays, obviously. But Jesus brings separation. He brings division. So don't be surprised. Don't think he's going to bring peace on earth, at least at this time. The way he's going <laughs> to bring peace is to take us home. And that's where we're going to have peace. Verse 54, and he said also to the multitudes, notice who he's speaking to, I think it's important. Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, oh, a shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see a south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites. He was always trying to win people over, wasn't he? <laughs> Hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? You see, he told the multitudes, he's now turning from his disciples to the multitudes, and he goes, you guys are pretty slick on your meteorology. You can look out to the west and you see a cloud rising. You say, oh, look, it's going to rain. You know what was to the west? The Mediterranean. And the clouds that come off of that have moisture. And when they move in and there's a temperature change, suddenly they drop rain. And so people be able to tell the weather by looking out and say, oh, look, it's going to rain because there are clouds coming. And if they felt the south wind, of course, you know that everything that's south of us is warmer. That's why everyone moves from New Jersey. <laughs> when you feel a south wind, you know that it's going to be warmer weather because this, this southern uh, jet stream is coming up. And he goes, how is it that you can understand the weather, but you can't look at the times and know that it's me? Jesus Christ came and he held them accountable to know the time of his coming. He also holds us accountable to know the time of his return. You remember him weeping over Jerusalem. He says this in Matthew 23, 37, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing Jesus held them accountable to know the time of his arrival. He's also holding us accountable to know the time of his arrival as well. Verse 57, he says, yes. And why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him lest he drag you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there until you have paid the very last might. What? That doesn't seem to fit. You've got a problem with somebody and you're on your way to court and you've got a disagreement. And so on the way to court, Jesus says you should do your best to reconcile before going to court, because you don't know what's going to happen. The judge can pronounce anything. And what are you going to do about it? I'm just going to get another lawyer. Well, I hope you have a lot of money. Jesus said, why not reconcile before it's too late? Before there's a point at which the judge takes over and you're done. Because you see, when Jesus comes back again, it's done. There's no more negotiating on the way. There's no more, hmm, I think I'll come to the Lord next year because I think he's coming in 2023. Really? 
Jesus is saying, do business with God now and get it straightened out because when he comes as judge, it may be too late for you. Absolutely will be too late. Right now we have a chance. You guys get that? Yes. Okay. It didn't seem like it fit, right? But it does. And there are all sorts of people that don't do this and because they don't negotiate and because they don't work things out and they just, they, they're, they're going to dig in and they're going to be angry. I mean, there's a whole list of people, uh, famous people that you may even know. We have a chance right now to reconcile with God. And if you haven't done business with him, if you haven't given your life to him, if you haven't accepted his authority, the person and work of Jesus Christ in your life, you can do that today, right this minute and he will accept you and forgive you of your sins and change your life. Do it now. Don't put it off. Don't say, I'll do it later. Do it now. It's that important. It should not ever wait. See these folks here? These are all mug shots. I hope they've done business with the Lord because it's too late now. They've been handed over to the judge and the judge is going to pronounce judgment, period. There are a whole bunch of people that you guys know or may not know. There's no more chance. Death is final. It is appointed unto a man once to die and then the judgment. Jesus says here in Luke 14, 27, it's a, it's a corollary passage. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is before he was crucified. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation, he's not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and he was not able to finish. You see, I was always told that was a passage that I should count the cost before accepting Jesus Christ. Because if I'm going to build my life upon him, I better make sure I have enough resource to be able to do it right. How many of you have heard that interpretation of this? We well, see the only other tower that I know of in the scripture is the Tower of Babel, which was a tower that was built by men so that they could have ultimate authority and they would gather everyone together and they would put the top up to heaven you see, they wanted to be the ones who were in charge and control everything. Sound familiar? Be careful if you're going to build a tower that is contrary to what God would have you do, and you're going to build your own life based upon your own foundation, and you think you're going to get to heaven based upon your own good deeds, you better make sure before you start building, because you may get halfway done and the Lord take you home, and then what? And none of it will mean anything. You understand that's what Jesus is talking about. Don't go building your life upon something that isn't Jesus Christ because you don't have what it takes when, it's, when you're going to stand before God as your judge. You understand? Okay. I'm sure those of you who disagree will argue with me later. Or, verse 31, which is a parallel passage, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who is against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and he asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus tells a parable of a king that has 10,000. He's going up against an army of 20,000. And if you don't have a good strategy and if you don't know how you're going to win with half as many people, you should send somebody as an emissary and work out peace lest you all die. Right? That just makes sense. Here's the thing. Can you stand before God on your own merits? Do you have what it takes? Of course not. You see how it works together with the tower. And so maybe you want to make peace with God. And there's one emissary who's Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus is telling us that we should reconcile with God while we may, while we can, because he is an overwhelming force that we can't fight. And his judgment is right. Amen. Okay. 
And he says, what it costs is our entire lives, that he wants us to give our entire lives to him. That's essentially what he's trying to tell us, I think, in these passages. Be awake, be vigilant, be ready, and seek reconciliation. Reconciliation with one another, reconciliation with God. Today is the day of salvation. If you don't know him as your Savior and as your Lord, it's a good idea to do so. It's the most important thing you will ever do is to be reconciled to God by the sacrifice of Jesus, his son. He's warned us. He's told us. He's encouraged us. And now we have, we have this wonderful roadmap of what he would have us to do. I'm hoping that you guys this Christmas will take all of this and we'll turn it into good, that the Lord might produce fruit in your life so that you might be able to share with other people the good news of Jesus Christ. But you may have to tell them the bad news. There's a judgment. There's a God who's perfect and holy in heaven. And when you stand before him, you better have a defense attorney. And the only defense attorney that's gonna be able to take your case and win is Jesus himself. Amen. 